The topic for December 2018 for Pathwork Steps is leadership, the art of transcending frustration. It's Pathwork Lecture 237. And when I put the title up on the website, I left off leadership and just put the art of transcending frustration because the word leadership, the concept of leading, very often sends people into emotional reaction against leadership as they have interpreted and experienced it in the real world. When you add leadership and the art of transcending frustration in the same phrase, it gives a better idea of what this lecture is about. Leadership is real whether you admit it or not. If you are not governing yourself, then you are being led by others. So the lecture is as much about inner leadership as it is about any outer manifestation of leadership. Guy uses an example that a boat needs a rudder in order to chart its course. I want to add to that that if a boat doesn't have a rudder, it will move based on forces that it does not actually control, that it can't contribute to, that it can't be in alignment with except to simply obey. So a boat in a moving river will go where the river takes it. A boat with a rudder can needs to accept the reality of the river and can make changes, can go in a different direction, can slow itself down, can pull over to the side. So that by abdicating self-leadership, self-governing, we are actually agreeing on some level, agreeing to leadership by and from others. So the lecture can be taken as a way to understand outer leadership in the real world, but that always starts with inner leadership. So the guide encourages the task is to go inward. Sometimes that feels to people as if it's narcissistic to always look at ourselves. But what Patrick teaches is if you can't do it, it is very difficult to demand that other people do what you feel that you cannot do, or more accurately, that you refuse to develop the ability to do. And that's an important distinction. There are many tasks in life where we are ignorant. We've never done it. We don't know what's involved. We have, never, have no experience with it. But as every one of you has experienced, there's always a starting point, and you have to ask questions, you have to look around at what's going on, you have to perhaps be educated on a topic or a subject, and then as you participate, you gain experience and you gain insight, you notice feedback, you change your point of view, you gather more facts. It's an, a, a spiral to gain experience and knowledge and education, experience, knowledge, education. The statement, but I don't know enough to lead, may be true in one moment. And yet, how do you get the experience? And the guide is suggesting that we start this path to inner leadership and then see where it leads you in terms of outer leadership. There's not a demand here. But if you cannot, um, if you're afraid of leadership at all, then it is very likely that you're not self-governing. And again, to repeat, if you're not self-governing, you're being led by others. So Pathwork tries to start with ourselves, our own ability to understand, and then we take it outside depending on our calling, our abilities, our life circumstances. So the task is to open inward before demanding or being expected to open outward. Um, part of what I'm gonna be 
repeating during this lecture is the idea of duality. The primary lecture on duality is Patrick Lecture 143, Unity and Duality. The concept of duality is important because there's a tendency to see things in terms of one choice or the other. Now, that may be practical on some level. Very often people say, would you like a ham sandwich or a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a cheese sandwich, where there are discrete and finite choices. This work is about spirituality. This work is about ethics and morals, beliefs, values. And it's not as black and white as what sandwich do you want. But there's a tendency to take the reality of the outer world and bring it into our inner world to simplify, to make it easier. So if I only have two choices, then I don't get as confused. It's easier to see the value of one over the value of the other. But this is a slippery slope. And where this leads us very often is into one choice is good and the other choice is bad. Now, if we add to that any fear, if we see one choice as being in our self-interest, one choice as helping our friends and family or advancing our values, then it is very likely that we will judge the other choice as bad. And this takes the polarity of uh, two choices and makes it extreme. The problem with dualistic thinking is that you wind up with one good choice everything else is bad, or I want it all, or I believe I will get nothing. Um, so in terms of leadership, um, when we have a lack of faith, when we don't fully believe in what we're doing, uh, one of our reactions is to focus on what's in front of us. And it leads to a desire for instant gratification instead of being able and willing to stand back and look at the larger picture and say, what is good for me overall? This is an example of self-governing, where we realize that we're being myopic, where we realize that we may not be seeing the larger picture, and we pull ourselves back and say, what are the larger choices? What are the uh, bigger realities here that I need to look at, I need to consider before I make the next decision that I need to make. So we are not only the larger sense of leadership, we are the decision makers as well. It's a complicated task. And we can become very bureaucratic and very focused on tasks and bring our vision down so that we're not realizing where we're heading. Uh, so a lack of faith in ourselves, a lack of faith in knowing what we need to know or understanding what we need to understand can lead us to focus on tasks instead of the larger picture. Once again, if you don't understand what's going on, it's time to educate yourself. Do some reading, get some advice, expand your knowledge of the world and your understanding of a situation. It's not a, once again, it's not black or white. It's not all or nothing. It's not, but I don't know today. Therefore, I won't know three days from now. It can be very surprising what you can learn in three days if you put your mind to it. I invite you to see very banal, very simple examples in your life where on Monday you didn't know how to do something and by Wednesday you felt comfortable with it. Anyone who has taken a new job has experienced this. Anyone who has moved into a new home or neighborhood has experienced this. Uh, even a new mother holding a baby for the first time can feel a little nervous. And within hours, certainly within days, a large number of us feel more comfortable, mothers and fathers, feel more comfortable holding, feeding, and bathing this amazing small package than we did when we were first introduced to it. So I invite you to take small examples of where you got up to speed very rapidly once you put your mind to it and contrast that to areas where 
you did not know what to do. And there was, I want to say a conscious choice because there is some consciousness to not getting help or not expanding or not looking. Where there is reluctance to get the information you need to understand the situation more thoroughly. Um, another example of conflicts in attitudes about leadership is that the best leader is the best follower. I was taught when I started my pathwork training as a helper that the best helper is the best worker. That for me to be a good pathwork helper, for me to be good at helping people understand the concepts, I personally needed to work on my willingness to look at my resistance, my fears, my negativities, my failings, my vices, to see them with love and charity and understanding to reduce my own fears. Because if I can't govern myself, it is going to be very difficult for me to honestly help people govern themselves. There's a place where we intuitively know bad leadership. And that leads me into talking about the difference between authority versus leadership. There is a difference. This lecture is not on authority. This lecture is on leadership. In leadership, if you think of it as a way of, of wanting us all to move forward for our highest good, and sometimes that means one of us cheerleads. Uh, sometimes that means that one of us goes and gets the information everybody needs and shares it. Uh, sometimes uh, it means that one of us is the counselor. By personality, we are able and willing to listen to people, to hear their fears and give some reassurance and some advice. So if you think of humanity or towns or villages or even a collection of four or five people trying to do a task, as uh, one entity instead of disparate. And that um, one person may be in charge of filling out paperwork or making key decisions. But within the whole group, if everyone takes a portion of the leadership role and says, I can do that, or let me try that, or how can I help you do your job? then in that way, it's not so much a matter of who is in charge of the group as a matter of whether all members of the group are active and willing to participate and eager to work through the challenges of what is at hand. So again, this is not about authority. This is about leadership. A uh, second aspect of one of the attitudes we have about leadership has to do with law. So law is an example of a real life reality that we all, we've all had to deal with, laws, rules, regulations. Leadership is about attempting to find the deeper meaning, the deeper substance, the deeper reality within the law, rather than just being a bureaucrat, rather than just being an external judge saying yes or no, to understand basically the spirit of the law so that we can uphold as best we can imperfect human regulations, imperfect human law, imperfect human uh, political structure, meaning uh, there are reasons why certain people are put into leadership positions that may or may not have anything to do with their uh, abilities. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And there's a reality where the leader of a group may not be the best person to do that job, but that's who's been appointed to that position. And the idea is if we're all leading, then we can help and support the growth, not only of the people in charge, but also of the quality of the task to be done, regardless of the failings of whoever's in charge. And the same thing goes with the law. The law as written by man, uh, regulations as written, are very often imperfect but they have a reason for existing and we can look at the reasons for the law and attempt to uphold the best parts of that 
while trying not to get hung up in the technical imperfections of rules and regulations. So these all have to do with conflicts uh, uh, in our attitudes about leadership. In the second week, uh, I, as a subtopic, I looked at leadership as giving. Now, this has to do with the best leader is the best follower, um, but leadership as guiding the decision-making process versus the actual moment of making the decision or determining which direction we go in. So, once again, the difference between leadership and authority is authority has the authority to make a decision. Leadership is about finding out if this decision is articulated correctly, if it may need to be reevaluated so that there are more choices, to find out what the objections within the group are, group even internally. What are my objections to this regulation, to this decision? And to find out, well, part of me likes it and part of me doesn't. Well, what is it about not liking it? What's going on here? To suss out what is the energy, even if it isn't easy to verbalize what resistance there might be to what's going on. So leadership as guiding the decision-making process versus making the decision. Avoiding guidance is a decision. So those of us to, who say, uh, I don't have time to make a decision are making a decision not to invest time in making the best decision in the moment. So saying no is a decision. And not saying anything is a decision. So that it is important to acknowledge the weaknesses in our own inner leadership. When you look at a situation and you say, and someone says that needs to be fixed, one of the first things I used to do in, I used to work in the business world, I was a systems analyst and troubleshooter, and I learned very quickly that the first thing you need to find out is, it's, it's not a simple matter. It's not a matter of the door is open or the door is closed, someone says the door should be closed, and you close it. Within a system, if something isn't happening, there's a reason why it's not happening. There could be an impediment, there could be a block, there could be resistance. There could be a conflict within regulations and rules so that people don't know which one to follow and that one gets left out. Um, so to, to be willing to take a look at any resistance in governing, in resistance in leadership, to find out what might be going on, rather than simply saying it's not happening, do something about it, or walk away because it's too frustrating to deal with. Um, part of leadership as giving is to recognize that at some level, all of us, including me, all of us want a super parent. We want someone to take care of us, someone to make the hard decisions, someone to tell us that what we've done is right, someone to take away the doubt and comfort us and make us feel supremely confident in the decisions that we have made in life. If you think about it in terms of the actual word, the part of us that wants a super parent wants to be a child. Part of self-governing is to acknowledge the parts of us that don't want to grow up, don't want to take responsibility, don't know how to handle stress, don't know how to defend our decisions, are afraid to make, uh, to take risks, to make decisions, uh, and a desire to palm that off onto someone else. When in reality, very few of us completely give the decision-making process to someone else. We give the momentary decision-making process to someone else, and then we complain about the result. So we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to be the child who is completely taken care of and who can complain about the parent whenever they are not happy with the decision that is made. So again, this process is about uh, taking responsibility for our own reluctance and beginning the work of dealing with it. Um, another aspect of this is to consider 
that you may be more ready than you realize. It's not easy to know what we're able to do until we're doing it. So when we look into the future, we, we can't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And it's scary to say, oh, I'll take care of that if we don't have confidence about taking care of something. But as a general rule, my belief is that you learn by doing. And the way people gain experience is they try to do it. The idea is not to leap into it, to claim expertise where you do not have expertise, but to eyes open, say, I may not be the best person for the job. I may not have every credential or quality uh, that is needed for the job, but I'll give it a try and I'll ask for help and I'll warn whoever is expecting me to do the task that I may need a little extra time or I may need some help or support. And if you think about your life, that's how you've operated. I do not know anyone who has not operated that way. We differentiate areas of our life where we are not terrified from the areas of our life where we are terrified. I'm inviting you to take a look at aspects of your life where you're not scared to death of doing something. And to notice how often you walk into situations without knowing what's going on, become surprised, gain knowledge, gain experience, and become comfortable in a situation faster than you might have realized. It is only in the situations where we have already projected failure, where we become frozen and resistant to even starting the process. Um, so in terms of leadership as giving and being a child and being the, the part of us that is immature, um, a phrase that I found in the lecture that I found very useful is to uh, a phrase that can identify where you pretend to give, but you are not giving. You are actually asking to get. And the phrase the guy uses is, you see, I gave. Now what do I get? So this is an example where there's not a real open-heartedness and willingness. It's actually a little barter that's going on. So we give solely in order to get something out of it. That's not real giving. When you do not really give, when there's fake giving, you get fake giving. So energetically, I believe that people know far more about what's actually going on than they choose to admit. I believe that people know real love from manipulative affection. I believe that people know real giving from a secret barter arrangement. They may not be able to verbalize it. And they may not be willing to verbalize it because they don't want or don't have the tools or don't have the experience to deal with con confrontation. It doesn't mean they don't know what's going on. And so the, the Patrick lectures teach that you do get what you, you do get what you give and to examine what you're giving if you're not happy with what you're getting. So leadership is not a tit for tat experience. Uh, leadership is a decision. This is what I want to do. I want to give service. And when you give service in the spiritual sense, uh, you don't get a paycheck on Fridays. Uh, you don't get specific rewards on specific time schedules. And it is not part of giving to expect people to give you specific kinds of feedback. So looking for a pat on the back is human, very human. But if you do something in order to get a pat on the back, then you're not being of service. You're just trying to bribe someone into doing something for you. Uh, and that leads into abilities needed for inner leadership. And the guide lists three abilities that need to be developed. Once again, if you don't have them today, today is the day to begin to practice, uh, to 
discover what faculties you're, you're, you don't have, to explore what is needed, and to begin the process of trial and error to develop skills and faculties. Uh, the first one is the willingness to be impartial and objective. Um, as part of this, it's, imp it's important to notice assumptions uh, that you have to manipulate reality. Some of these phrases are so straightforward and so simple that we overlook them. We just keep reading. One of my goals in creating these study guides, and for those who notice, I try not to add anything to the lectures, rather to clarify what's already in the lectures. So I try not to talk about them, rather to bring forward what is in the regular, in the, in the usual lecture form, it's buried in a very uh, wordy paragraph. And it's easy to run right past that and not see some very important and wonderful concepts that could take weeks and months, even years of, of work to really understand and appreciate. Uh, so one of these is an assumption that you have to manipulate reality. Uh, another thing I do with the study guides is I put down exercises. I do this, I, I want to acknowledge that one of the people in the Pathwork Steps groups asked me specifically to do this. He said, I could use some help. All this clarification is great. What do I do that week? And so I began a process of finding within the lecture specific things the guide says, try this. And bringing them out once again with more clarity, naming them exercise 2A, exercise 2B. They're in there, but they're easy to skip right past. Um, so uh, in terms of manipulating reality, an example would be to spend one week. It sounds like a lot of time. It's not. It's a matter of looking at using daily review and reviewing at the end of the day. Let me see. Let's assume I manipulated reality or tried to manipu manipulate reality at least once today. Where would I have done that? And to consider. Where did I try to shade the facts? Where did I promote a point of view as if it was a fact when it was actually my opinion? Where did I only present the facts that would sway the person I'm talking to to follow my suggestion and not mention alternative options, uh, other pieces of information that might have led them to consider an option I didn't want them to consider? This is what I mean about, uh, this is what I mean by saying that we do attempt to manipulate reality. When you're trying to manipulate reality, you're not being impartial and objective. You have an agenda. A large portion of Pathwork is to recognize our agendas. People think that if you recognize your own agenda, the next step will be abandoning it. But that's a black and white uh, fear-based reality. Consider this. If I do not see all the options clearly, and I only see one option that benefits me, I have no reason not to go with the option that benefits me because I do not see the full spectrum of possibilities. And because I do not see the full spectrum, I cannot see where if I give up a little bit of advantage in the decision that mostly benefits me, I might be able to make a choice that benefits everybody, makes everybody much happier, which would make me much happier than getting my own way. And this is what I believe the guide means when he says, invites us to do things that is in the highest good of all, that there is a long-term happiness, and a short-term sense of happiness that doesn't last. And we're being invited in spiritual work of all kinds to consider long-term happiness. And that means that we will be happier in the long term than if we try to manipulate things so that we get a gain here that later makes us feel bad 
about what we've done or where we realize that other people got left out. So you have to define, for instance, when you look at your values, you need to define what happiness really is for you. Is happiness only centered on your personal space, your personal happiness? Or can you, can you begin to understand where if everybody in your working vicinity were happier, how much better the day might be and that you might not mind not having all your needs met because the needs that are being met are being met to such a more profound and real degree. So again, impartiality and objectivity are needed in order to look at your prejudices, your lack of ability to see, and to see other options more clearly so that you can make a more mature decision than you may be making today because you, you don't see these other options. Um, second ability for inner leadership is a willingness to risk uh, exposure and criticism. I saw an article today, a very short article, uh, that proposed that, for instance, if a business person wanted to open a, a restaurant, there's, I'm going to exaggerate, I always like to play with duality and say there's two ways to do this. So one way, the extreme way, would be I want to open a business, I will uh, purchase a piece of property and buy the licenses and hire the staff, and I will go all in. I will risk everything to make this work. And sometimes that works. Huge risk. What the article was suggesting was that while that might be something you may need to do at some point to truly expand your idea, using business as an example of an idea, um, there are other ways to do it. There are ways to take a big idea one step at a time so that you not only aren't risking everything on a literal roll of the dice, but so that you can take a step or two, evaluate, come back, adjust, and take a few more steps. This isn't as dramatic, doesn't make for as great a story, and it can be so much easier emotionally. It can create such a, a more uh, open and uh, productive environment for you to work in where your life is not on the line about every decision you make. So willingness to risk exposure and criticism is not about all or nothing. It's about becoming willing to engage in the process of dealing with the future. Remember that for the majority of us, we think we're open to the future when we're actually opening to repeating the past. I had a good day yesterday, and so I'm going to do the same thing, and then I'll have a good day tomorrow. But reality is that what pleased us yesterday may not please us tomorrow. And if you wanted to encapsulate leadership, leadership is about saying, I had a great day yesterday. What is it about that great day that I could continue to incorporate in my life without attempting to mimic what happened yesterday? What are the elements? How would those elements be available in other choices? Was it the newness of the event, the surprise? That cannot be repeated by mimicking the same event. Surprise only happens once. So willingness to risk exposure and criticism is a matter of saying, I'm going to make some choices. They may not be popular and they may expose me to some risk. How can I do that and be able to manage it? The third element, um, third ability needed for inner leadership is to be able to understand that frustration will arise. And this is where leadership and frustration tie together. And it arises because leadership 
tends to fall in a pothole. It tends to fall in a rut. Uh, if I'm in charge, then this is what I want. And the next step is, and I must have it. Now, in duality, there's always a, a pulling forward and a running away from. So I must have it always includes what you, that there's something you must not have. If you must have X, you can't have Y. And if you can't have Y, then there's something out there, A, B, C, something that you must have to help you avoid what you must not have. So it's a second phrase in this lecture that's very useful, uh, quick to understand. Uh, and that is that frustration arises when you feel that you must have something or you must not have something. And so there's a desperation about avoiding that. But in the real world, you're not going to be able to avoid uh, the gray areas of life. Life is not truly black and white, good and bad. So if you're terrified of, um, let me pick black and white just as a uh, polar example. If you're terrified of white and you must have black, then gray will frighten you as well. And gray will frustrate you because it's a mixture of black and white. And even the mixture will generate this fear that there is something about white that you must not have and it's, it's in the gray. So to be able to look at things and say, I must have, hmm, that's that probably fear-based or dualistic. Or I must not have and see that that is also laced with fear and duality, is a skill, it's an ability. I've been doing this work for 25 years, and I cannot tell you a day that goes by where I'm not stuck in a duality, even for a few moments. To recognize that you're in dualistic thinking is not the end of the world. It's a joke about duality. It's not the end of the world to make a mistake or to be dualistic or to make, uh, do something stupid. This work is about being able to catch yourself in a reasonable period of time. Um, I have found that there's very little I can do where if I don't issue a heartfelt apology, a thorough and heartfelt apology as rapidly as I can, taking full responsibility for whatever it is that I did, where people aren't willing to work with me. And that's one of the solutions. That's what uh, is not apparent about risk or being objective or subjective. Well, what if, I, what if I think I'm objective and I'm not? People will be very happy to give you feedback about that. People are very happy to comment or friends will be able to advise you. It's not lack of feedback that will be your problem. It will be your fear of hearing the feedback. Your fear that if you're stopped from doing something, you will miss out on something else that you desperately want, the I must have. So these are skills that are useful for inner leadership. And once we develop inner leadership, then it is surprisingly easy for that to spill over into our lives, regardless of the external titles or recognition that people give. Uh, I'm thinking of a phrase where you can always spot the leader in a group. You can always spot the person where people check in with them before they make a final decision because they have learned that that person has something to offer. That that person is a resource that helps all of them make better decisions. It's almost a, in body language, it's almost an involuntary turning towards people in the room who have something to offer. Now, does this happen in a fear-based situation with bad leadership? Yes, it does. But just because it happens with bad leadership does not mean you don't need it for good leadership as well. So if you develop inner leadership, then there will be a natural spillover into the outside world, which is up to you how you uh, continue that process or manifest that process. But without the inner leadership, what you wind up with is a forcefulness of personality, a, a matter of how aggressive you can be, and you have lost that link to your internal morals, beliefs, ethics, and desires. 
and are working completely in the outside world. Um, the last section of this lecture, uh, once I examined it, I can be very surprised reading a lecture I've read many times. And I'm reading the lecture and I have a habit, because uh, I have an electronic version, of hitting return when I think a point has been made and bullet pointing, uh, editing as I go, because you can always throw the edited copy away. And when I got to this last section, I read very clearly where the guide says, this is the first step, and the next step is, and the next step is. And if you isolate out the moments where the guide says, this step, that step, this step, you wind up with four steps in the art of transcending frustration. So step one is to express willingness. Sounds simple, but it's really important to work on your willingness to address your frustration, to notice your assumptions. Uh, step two is to find the meaning of the particular frustration. One of the ways we avoid making decisions by making it impossible to make decisions is by allowing ourselves to become overwhelmed. So the feelings rise up and they are very strong and very scary and we surrender I'm going to take that back. We don't surrender. We submit to the feeling of overwhelm rather than arguing, wait a minute. A lot of feelings going on here. Let's, let's take a look at what's happening. I'm going to suggest to you that our inner dialogues can be as complicated as a room of 10 people, if not 50, but we'll just take 10. If you have a room full of 10 people, and all of a sudden there's a lot of feeling in the room, people will start talking and they'll all be trying to express different points of view from different perspectives based on different experience and different uh, concepts of, of what should be done. And the room can become, uh, it becomes a, a impossible to manage. Internal leadership is finding a way in your own way because this is unique to you to find a way to say, everybody sit down. We're going to walk through and we're going to listen to everybody's argument. We're going to make a list. I'm a list maker. We're going to make a list and we're going to list all the objections, all the fears, all the concerns. And then once we have those clearly delineated, it can become fairly obvious which ones are temporary or I don't want to say the word silly, but not based in reality, based in the moment, based on what if. So easy to be afraid of what if when there's nothing to support that that might happen. So um, find the meaning of the particular frustration. Sort through the chaff of all the feelings. Find out what the frustration is, boil it down to what I must have or what I must not have. And take a cold, clear look at the reality of that situation. So find the particular frustration and what it's about. Step three is to open to the discovery of the meaning of that frustration. This is a little energetic, it's a little spiritual, it's not as easy for me to explain. I get it, but it's hard to explain. Sometimes when you see what's actually true, you begin to realize why you weren't able to see that before. So it's not about the fact itself. It's about the realization of where you were blind where you were kidding yourself, where you were not impartial, where you were subjective, where you had an agenda. I personally, uh, I work very hard to notice my blind spots and my bias. I'm not saying I'm happy to find out where I'm blind and biased. I'm certainly not happy to find it. But the tools that Pathwork has given me work so well that I have a certain level of confidence that once I find it, I'm going to be able to work through it 
in a fairly uh, rapid time span. That I can work through my shame and my fear, that I can get a new reality, and I can begin to incorporate it into my life without becoming overwhelmed and lost and throwing a fit or throwing a tantrum. The one example I can think of may sound very silly, uh, but in the moral and political and cultural climate of 2018, uh, I had a moment, I collect films, I have a very large film collection and I love film. I had a moment where I realized how discrimination and prejudice were so much a part of the history of filmmaking, that the history of filmmaking represented our culture. And I began to realize the magnitude of discrimination against classes of people, races of people, genders of people, worker, uh, leader, the cruelty, the, the unconscious cruelty with which we excluded certain people from even being discussed. And I remember the day I had the realization that I would never again be able to watch hundreds of movies that I dearly loved without feeling slightly uncomfortable with this new realization. Now, if I stayed in the, I have lost something I took pleasure in, that can feel despair and hopeless. But again, these tools have helped me to move on, to continue to move through that, to accept the feelings of loss. And that, that was the feeling I'm trying to describe, complete loss. I have lost this joy that I've had for my, my whole conscious life. Since I started watching television when I was six years old, this joy that I have experienced my entire life is over. That's not true. There can be joy even in watching old snapshots, old pictures of old time periods that we don't want to necessarily repeat. We can gently and lovingly see these as that's how we were, that's what we thought, and still retain brilliance, genius, humanity, wisdom, love, all those things are still there. It's like an aggregate, like concrete with pebbles in it. You can still find the pebbles, even though it's in what you now recognize as concrete. So if I move through the feelings of loss, then I can realize that it is better for all of us that we are wiser, more loving, more fair. And if that costs me the pleasure of unconscious, unconsciously sitting down for an hour and a half and not even thinking and enjoying something, that's a good trade-off because my awareness of what I didn't realize before is going to help me not repeat the past. It's going to help me not blindly follow old uh, more, mores, uh, old ways of doing things. It's going to help me work with the changes that society as a whole would like to work through. It will help me be more loving, more fair, more generous. You have to be aware of the potholes so you don't fall in them. Uh, so it's a trade-off. I don't have to throw away my old pleasures, but they're not the same kind of pleasures that they were. And in exchange, I have gained awareness. And my awareness will help me from building into the future what I experienced unconsciously without arguing about it without realizing it in the past. Now, it's a bit of a digression, but this is what I'm trying to explain when I say open to the discovery of the meaning, to really be in a place of recognizing that the frustration was not what you may have thought it was, and to allow that to reverberate because step four is to find the spiritual meaning. 
So in my moment of, oh, I've lost all my pleasure. The penny had dropped about how not only had society not been aware, I had not been aware. And if I wasn't aware, I couldn't help. And now I can help. Now I can be, I, I struggle with this, uh, I can be more inclusive of pronouns when I speak to people about their relationships. I can be more aware of pronouns when I'm trying to identify someone's place in society because gender is becoming more fluid. I can become more aware of uh, different people's uh, struggles fitting into society and finding places because I can recognize that even I, and I, I don't mean to minimize my prejudice, even I hadn't seen some things. And this is part of leadership. Rather than pointing fingers at other people for things I recognized 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I recognize where I also have something to learn and therefore they may need that moment of discovery. How can I support others? in embracing moments of discovery that in the moment may feel like they're going to lose a lot and they haven't yet realized what they could gain. And that I think is leadership, both inner and outer. Um, thank you for being interested in Pathwork. Thank you for listening to a discussion. I hope you have discussions of your own with groups um, with friends, uh, with uh, loved ones, about ideas that are important to you. So thanks again. <laughs>